prison. And that means it's got to go to the Supreme Court. There has to be a court case. I wonder if there ever was a court case for this. Probably was. U.S. versus Schenck, 1918, clear and present danger doctrine. The government, or basically what it says, you do not have blanket freedom of speech or freedom of press or freedom of the assembly. But of course, then again, once you say you do not have blanket freedom of the press, freedom of speech, freedom of the assembly, of the assembly, now we can define that in any number of ways we want. This is still on the books. President Obama enforced this more than any other president since Richard Nixon. Basically, shut up reporters. There's a whole thing about what he had a very complex relationship with reporters, I always found fascinating and scary. My guess is someday they will discover it in the current administration. And who knows? I mean, you know, we got to be a terror attack in Sweden, we got to move out. And so, those kind of things, we just got to move on from there. Okay, I'm mocking the fact that <laughs> President Trump said something about a terror attack in Sweden. That didn't happen. All right. So sweet. Is it? Yeah, they've been neutral since the, since, oh, okay. yeah. since the Napoleonic Wars. Okay, so we do a couple things. Take out the worksheet for the video, but also take out the notes because I didn't quite finish something and I decided literally this morning I better finish before we finish the video. Because so I never really talked about the new rules of war. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I just gotta make sure I know which one if it's just, you're using historical content or audience or purpose or point of view. Just make sure it's clear. And only one. Yeah, a couple sentences. But basically explain the historical content from example and how you would use that in our it has to be a thesis statement. So you're like you're writing the whole essay. Just give me the thesis statement. On page 549 of the review book. Yeah. For the for the thesis statement for your blueprint, just give a. It has to be relatively specific, but it could be your know, general things like you know. Um, you know, the issue of like under the seventh or something like that. <laughs> okay, so I didn't quite get to the full thing about total war. I thought I would be enough, but then I started thinking about that. No, that's not going to be enough. So, so remember total war. What is the new front in total war? We will. Okay, so we got a home front. Oh, let's get to a good post. And what do they want to destroy at the home front? Yeah, industry, oil. Uh, it also is what kind of attack? It's basically. It's state sponsored something as those are hmm? Yeah, this is state sponsored terrorism. Can't get a victory on the battlefield, can't get some kind of political solution, use terror. You try to overthrow the government, try to create revolution, try to get the government, people force government to change. Nobody likes terrorism until they're using it. Then they'll justify it. Well, we have no choice, we have to. Everybody does this in total war. And this, one of the things I really like about the espionage act, that's a classic example of how countries will say we can't allow dissent. It'd be no coincidence that when the war is over, there's going to be, they're going to call it a red scare. And they're going to go after other people who might be seen as undesirables within the country using the espionage act, even though the war was over. This kind of hatred, this kind of fear does not end when the war is over. And so, I uh, mentioned propaganda, 
to inspire fear. I just like these two pollsters because it's a great example of one simple thing. Everybody in the Allied Powers, the Germans were actually giant apes. They could easily grab the globe. Good propaganda is simple. A simple message and repeat it over and over again. Germans are monsters. Of course, nobody believed Germany looked like this or this. That doesn't matter. Just reinforce it to where that attitude of German being subhuman monsters or vice versa, it becomes normal. You take the, you take something that would be seen as abnormal and unusual and turn it into, well, this is a way people think. This is normal. I love this one because it's saying, we don't know what the world will be and what country is that for? What country is this a propaganda poster for? It's allied, obviously, because of Germans. Huh? Good I guess for Russia, but it's not. You're, I mean, it's good guess. Here. Close. So most of the fighting's happened in Europe, but look what they get in this map to make sure Australia is in it. It's Australia. The blood is coming there. I did that to great poster again. Why is that? Oh, because they're that's U.S. Army. It's not subtle at all, is it? But the part I like the best, and what makes it good, effective propaganda, is the Germans were claiming they were defending their, their civilization. Look at the club. Isn't that clever? That is a clever bit of propaganda. That's what real German civilization is. Are we going to let them come ashore in, excuse me, come ashore in America? And look at Europe behind it. And ravage, ravage you know, America. Join the U.S. Army. And so, let's get to this really quick. New rules. New rules of war. Total war are going to allow for new weapons and new ideas that were simply not going to be, that would have been seen as inhuman. Gas is the first one. Like, the, like all of a sudden now, it's okay to use these unconventional weapons, chemical weapons. Because once you make this step from chemical weapons, those are all kinds of weapons, and think about gases. So here's a, here's phosgene gas. Phosgene gas floating along, a little bit lighter than air, so it is going up. It dissipates. It wasn't as good, a, as effective as other gases. But it's not going to also say, oh, you're a, you're a good guy, or you're a child. I'll go over you and get the next one. It is an indiscriminate killer. You can't control it. And think about once you have that logical step to use something like this weapon you can't control, doesn't it become easier to use other weapons? You can see the logic from gas to nuclear, or biological, or any number of weapons. That logical step. This is a German attack in 1915, and this is a great picture, because it shows them there actually has these canisters of gas, and they open it up and hope the wind blows it towards the enemy. Then here are the German lines coming. Boy, you would see the tactics are still pretty bad. Just lined up for machine guns, aren't they? Now, the Germans did the first gas attack in 1915. They had talked about it, but it was always like, do we want to take this step? Well, the Germans surrounded were the first ones to do it. They tried against the Russians. It's in present-day Poland now. That's just right about here. And it did cause panic, but they didn't really exploit the breakthrough. In Belgium, they tried against Canadian forces right here in 1915. The true world war, huh? Canadian. Germans attacking Canadian forces in Belgium. And it was chlorine gas caused panic. When you breathe in chlorine gas, it's almost like you drown in your own mucus. It, yeah, it's that. And the Germans couldn't exploit the breakthrough partially because you had to attack through the gas. And by that night, the Canadians had figured out a way. They'd already been talking about it, so they were kind of ready. They didn't have gas mash yet. Anybody know what they did? Square cloth, like a surgical mask, and then urinate on it and put it on here and that would filter out. Okay, yeah, but it's better than gas. And one more thing. Remember, it's your name. <laughs> You're not going to other people. You have the best. <laughs> See? Yours, so you can at least get a gentleman that way. Okay. 
So here are German soldiers attacking through mustard gas. Those are American soldiers. I like that picture, very creepy. A quintessential shot of British machine gunners with a gas mask on, that is a great picture. And of course, rigged one up for the mule. <laughs> Chlorine and phagene were used at first, but the, the worst was mustard gas. It vaguely smelled like mustard. It was heavier than air, so it would sink into trenches. And it was a blistering agent, so if you have enough got in your skin, it would literally start like uh, ripping apart, um, at first irritating, then kind of eating away your skin, if you got enough at it. What was bad was the eyes. Think about what that would do to your eyes. So there's gonna be all these shots. Here's British soldiers in 1918, but you see similar ones of Americans. Blinded by mustard gas. They couldn't get their gas mask on the top. That's an American soldier that's blistering from the mustard gas. <laughs> but if you breathe enough of it, it literally ate away your lungs and you drowned in your own blood inside your chest cavity. And it could take two days of hell. The mustard gas was mustard gas was a horrible weapon. A couple things about it though. After the initial shock, if you got your gas mask on, it was awful, uncomfortable, terrible, we would fight. Mustard gas did not turn the tide on the battlefield. None of these weapons did. They were not decisive on the battlefield. And even though almost half of all the shells by 1918 used by both sides were gas shells, they started having those kind of shells, which is what they're doing right here. Those had to have masks on to put the shell in. It didn't really affect the battlefield. Mustard gas, though, and well, because of that, they didn't use it hardly at all in World War II. It just didn't work on the battlefield. Even though they had lots of it, and so they carried gas masks. Also, the United States, along with West Germany, would supply millions of gallons of this to Iraq in the 1980s. When they were fighting Iran, they were scared Iran might defeat Iraq. And that limited effect on the battlefield, but as it turned out, Iraq, Iraq would use it against a rebelling Shia and Kurd, Kurds within the whole country. Using mustard gas, the US and West Germany gave it. The irony of that is that'd be one of the excuses the United States would use to attack them in 2003, that they use chemical weapons on their own people. Weapons that we help them get. What a strange world we have, huh? I like that one. Yeah. Got the pooch there. Mustard gas is a pretty horrible weapon, but if it didn't work on the battlefield, what would it do to civilians? That is when the gas, when you made that big leap. There would be some gas attacks by 1918, and the plan was for the Allies, if war would have continued in 1919, mass waves of bombers dropping gas on German civilians. In this region here, the industrialized Ruhr and Rhine River. And so those are British school children getting ready for the next war. And I just thought this picture is just, it's so creepy. You see it? And then you would pump, you'd have to constantly pump to get air in for a baby. And you know, these kind of unconventional weapons that they'll eventually soon call name, the name doesn't really quite fit, but Going to the 1990s, they'll say weapons of mass destruction are these kind of unconventional weapons, and it starts here, the logic of total war. Next, number two, a starvation blockade. They were in blockades and trying to cut off military supplies as long as there have been war. But in World War I, it would come to an art form, a blockade that's meant to starve as many civilians as possible. And we'll come to back to unrestricted submarine warfare in just a second, but that fits in with it. This graph shows that almost 80% of the food in Britain and 40% of the food in Germany, it was imported. And so both sides thought if we could cut off the food, this, into these two countries, they could starve. We could, we could make the civilian population starve, untold amount of terror, the chance of famine that affects every family a little bit differently. You turn one group of people against the other who might have food, might not. This could lead to revolution, food riots. That was the plan. And one thing they don't mention here is that Germany got about 70% of the fertilizer. They imported that in. Without fertilizer, your crop yields aren't as high. Also, if you don't have grain, you don't have fodder to feed animals. 
What do you do about your horse, cow, pigs, whatever? The Germans would actually slaughter almost all of them. That John Peter. Foolish, foolish move. And so what the British did is they here and down here would stop any ships going into the central problems. And they would say they're going to find contrabands. So any merchant ship, including ships from neutral countries like the United States, they would be stopped and then usually escorted to Britain. And tell me, what trade items could be used by a country at war? <laughs> Every single thing, couldn't it? Any, you could justify anything. So basically what they did is they stopped all foreign trade with Central Holland. For a while, they traded to neutral Netherlands, and then the British just cut that off too. Sorry, Dutch, you're not going to trade either. And the thing was, the Germans started getting real food shortages by 1916. The cities here, where there's a black dot, there were food riots in 1916, and it's arguable, arguable that food riots helped bring down the German government in 1918. By geography, Russia was having similar food problems, and that, that certainly helped bring down the Tsar in 1917. It's hard to know the exact numbers because, okay, who's dying of starvation? Who's dying because malnutrition has led them to be more susceptible to disease? And there could be any number of reasons, but German figures have as many as 290,000 people died of famine and shortage of food by 1918 in Germany. Mostly young people or the elderly, and this is going to be called they're going to either call it the blockade or the starvation generation. So think about when the war ended, children younger, you know, 10, 12 years and younger. Hmm, about 20 years, they'll be even 15 years. Bitter, never quite as healthy, difficult life. You know, they're probably going to be a little bit smaller, more susceptible to disease. Hmm. I'd have a lot of grievances. Wouldn't they be perfect little Nazis? They're mad. They're mad at the Allies. They want revenge. It's the same generation. It's no coincidence. And the Allies kept this blockade on for six months after the war ended to force the Germans to sign the treaty. They continued to starve people. What do you think they were teaching in schools the whole time between the wars in Germany? Not only that, we should have won, but well, what they did. Why did we lose traitors? That is a horse that died on the street of Berlin, and before they could even remove the body, a lot of horses starved to death because they didn't have enough food to feed them. They're already ripping it apart to get as much food, and I guarantee you that gut pile will be gone pretty soon, too. Everything's edible. I'm glad that picture is not in color. Here's a food ride in 1916 in Hamburg. But the Germans responded with u boats And what the weapon they would choose is they would write an unrestricted submarine warfare. Unrestricted submarine warfare means sinking without warning. Sinking without warning. And the blockade rules that basically Efforts to international law at the end of the 19th into the 20th century actually set rules up for a blockade. And since these are civilian ships, if a, sh if a ship is blockaded, they're, they're supposed to be stopped and either escorted to a neutral port, and if that's impossible, the crew must be allowed to go on lifeboats and then the ship would be sunk. The problem for the Germans was this. Their navy wasn't strong enough to blockade Britain. So they used a relatively new weapon, submarines. The problem with submarines, very thin skin, very small, very vulnerable. All it takes is one hole in a submarine, and it's worthless. They submerge and don't come back up. Which, by the way, also tells you why submariners have to be pretty crazy. U-boat or under sea boat, the great German language, underwater boats. And here's a... a a freighter that's sunk by a German submarine in surface. But if an enemy ship comes, or it's the British started started disguising guns on board the freighters to try to catch submarines, all it takes is one hole. 
they're done. And so Germans, by in 1915, began to sink without warning, unrestricted submarine warfare. That means they're going to sink ships, they know crew will die, and it's going to happen. If they're out in the middle of the ocean, and a ship comes in, is coming into Britain, the Germans are, the submarine's not going to say, is that a passenger ship or a freighter? What are they going to do? Fire first. And so passenger ships are going to be sunk. American-owned ships, and the U.S. is neutral, will be sunk. This area would be a free fire zone, essentially, in 1915. Now, the Germans didn't have enough subs to hold everywhere, but they would just park right there or right there. May 7, 1915, the British passenger liner, the Lusitania, was sunk. And by a design flaw, it sunk really fast after it was hit by a torpedo. Over 1,200 passengers, including about 200 Americans, died. It's a passenger liner, one of the fastest ships. Pretty amazing. It was actually going a little bit slower to say coal and a few other things, but it sunk in sight of the Irish coast, right here. And they could see the Irish coast. But by a combination of not having enough lifeboats and how fast the ship sunk, all these people died. The international outcry was huge. Now, the United States did not enter the war, but they demanded Germany to end unrestricted submarine warfare. And this is a great cartoon of that. Once again, culture. It's a clever, that's a clever political act. But Germany in 1917 would go back to unrestricted southern warfare, rolling to die, hoping to starve Britain. And that would be a major factor for the United States in World War I. Sinking ships without warning. When World War II began, there wasn't even a question that both sides were going to do this. And yeah, the Germans sunk a lot, but nobody was more successful in sinking merchant ships than the United States Navy against the Japanese. It's actually shocking how many ships the United States sunk. And yes, passenger liners, of course. This is total war. Ever, you can justify pretty much everything. Next, bombing sheep from the sky. As we all know. Okay, so that's a Zeppelin. That'd be the first weapon used to bomb. And it's a German design, it's a rigid airship, it's not a blimp, a blimp is just a balloon. Okay. This has a frame, and you can actually get up inside, and have these big, huge rubber bladders inside, full of some lighter than air gas. The blockade kept them from getting helium, so what lighter than air gas did the Germans use? Hydrogen. And, that, and the hydrogen's mortal enemy is fire. Needless to say, this was very dangerous and very risky, but I love this picture just because it shows a Zeppelin. And this was a little postcard before World War I, and my favorite part is this. Why did they decide, you know, we want to have a Zeppelin, but we need, it, we need some contrast. Sheep. And so that just strikes me as really funny. In 1915, they started using Zeppelins to attack London. They always thought they could just knock London out because they always thought Britain's commitment wasn't going to be that big. So they started bombing civilians from the air. Now that is a Zeppelin right there. That is a painting of a night attack. They're so easy to shoot down because of hydrogen. They had to attack at night. And because of that, they couldn't hit anything. So they just would essentially try to drop their bomb in about half in this floor on residential. That random chance of killing civilians. Can someone with a rifle shoot down the entire plane that they got at this one bullet? Not necessarily, but they need something on the bullet that would be flammable. What they would do is paint something like uh, it's called white phosphorus that ignites, and that would do. You ever see that, like a machine gun and they have a tracer? That's, that's what it is. And once they figured that out, so it would be relatively ineffective except for you know, kind of open the door. So I was taking this walking tour of London. And it was called, it was the gaslight, I can't remember gaslight <coughs> tour of London. And yeah. Is that where Led Zeppelin got its name from a Zeppelin? Hmm? <laughs> oh, I know where No, they got to keep them. So they were walking down. Yeah. The drummer of the Who said that band will fly like a Led Zeppelin. Oh, and that's what they do. Yes. One of those random things I just know. So I'm walking along in this gaslight tour, which was a great tour. And I'm walking along, and all of a sudden I looked down, and there was a little candy bar. 
And it's like a little crackle. Like, I was like, look, a candy bar. And I looked at it. I was not going to eat candy off the street. At least the people were watching me. And I looked down and saw that. And I, go, hmm. and I look up, and there's... I had no idea this was there. I would have walked right by it because we're on this level, if not for that little candy. <laughs> so I had to take that picture. Like, wow! Yeah, yeah, I was very important to get candy bar in. Okay, so, but quickly you can imagine once you started drop. I love the picture of them dropping Bob. <laughs> I like this with a little handle. Okay, that's relatively ineffective, but you can just imagine how. By 1917, you're going to have two and four engine like this big British bomber and bombing cities, carrying 4,000 pounds of bombs. The plan was for waves of Allied bombers to bomb <coughs> Western Germany, civilian targets in 1919. That was a propaganda poster to try to convince Germans to fight harder or British bombers will kill you. World War II. The assumption was it'd be mass waves of bombers. Didn't quite happen as fast as people thought for lots of reasons, but soon that's, especially the Allies. So, number four, genocide. When they say genocide, there have been instances of this before, and people will look back before the Industrial Revolution and say that's a genocide. You made the argument about the slave trade or what happened to American Indians, but genocide's a little bit different. Genocide is using the industrial power of a modern state, a modern state and the modern industry to destroy a people based upon what? Why? Why destroy them? It's not for what they did. They didn't do anything necessarily. It's because of their religion. It's because of their race. It's because of their nationality, even political beliefs. Everyone got that. Race, religion, political value, belief, it's not for what they did. It's for who they are. Because think about total war. You're fighting for the very existence of your country. The artists that we cannot dissent. But just imagine if you have a, a group of people in your country that you can't trust. You said, I can't trust them. They might... They might actually be the enemy. They might join the enemy. What if you have that potential enemy with them? Something about them. They might naturally be traitors. And you're already looking at the past espionage acts, so start looking for enemies. So in this region of the Ottoman Empire, right here, now it's just Turkey, but it's the Ottoman Empire then. In fact, this whole area here into Iran, what is now Iraq, into then it was Russia. Where are the Armenians? Armenians, Christians, uh, it's more like an ethnic group because they're all Semitic in this area right here. Armenian Christians. And the Ottomans had no trouble with, with people who weren't Muslim in the Ottoman Empire, just as long as they paid a little bit extra taxes. Actually, they kind of liked it because they could charge them more taxes. But going to the 20th century, the empire weakened and and became to look for scapegoats, Armenians became considered by many Ottomans an, an enemy or a potential enemy, then war began. The country of Armenia is right there. There's a significant population of Armenians in that part of Russia, and they're fighting the Russians right there. By 1915, as the war started going badly here, they didn't want to blame poorly trained troops who didn't have like winter coats when they're fighting at 12,000 feet. No! It's, we must have something. Something is making us weak. Those Armenians can't be trusted. They're probably more one of the Russians. And what began as essentially trying to round up Armenians away from the battlefield turned into, in the 1990s, they would call it ethnic cleansing. Forcibly moving Armenians to these gathering points. And there it turned into, well, we have the enemy now. We can't let them. We can't let them go. And soon, the tools of modern war. Hundreds of thousands of machine guns killed, slaughtered. And once they started that, then it became more efficient. The gathering of people, bringing them to common locations, and machine gunning them, or starving them. 
Hundreds of thousands were marched into the desert to die in the desert. Simply got rid of them. People knew. Yeah. So is this kind of the first idea of concentration camps? Well, con remember the concentration camps that came, remember the Spanish American War? Was that going on in Cuba? So there are, and the British did it in the World War, so there were concentration camps, but yeah, we're getting to. Now, concentration camps are horrific <coughs> prisons, but these are kind of kind of what, what the Germans would do in World War II, and they, they literally made death camps for this purpose. So that's kind of a similar thing to that. And there would be a number that would be left alive. Look at this, tur this Ottoman official taunting, starving Armenian kids with a little bit of food. Just laughing at them. Here are Armenians gunned down by the tens of thousands of men's, women, and children. You can see this picture was taken a couple days after they're starting to float. And just awful. Off into the desert. It was reported in the news that the Armenia would be one of the excuses the United States would use. Yes. How did they like gather them? Go through and just and, and Turkey civilians helped. You, the Ottoman civilians would help round them up, but they just would go through a dump point and force everyone to come to common locations. They wouldn't leave, they'd shoot up people's homes, things like that. And basically, they, they made it clear if you don't leave, we'll kill you. But if you leave, well, they. It was one of those things where they didn't believe they would actually kill them. They didn't. And then they did. Like, they're going to take it someplace else, away from the front, and they won't kill us. Right. This is a really surreal picture of Armenian survivors after the war, and they're posing with the skulls of Armenian victims. I just found that to be one of the weirdest pictures. The genocide did not end until 1923. You can't just shut this off. In fact, this will become a very important part of the country, the new country of Turkey's modern people. Uh, um, modern statehood, and it's kind of quickly forgotten as other things happen in between the wars. When Hitler was questioned about his policies to try to force Jews to leave the country, he really leave Germany in 1938, and he says this could lead to enemies around the world. They want to fight the Soviets, or they're thinking, we're going to fight the Soviets, we don't want everyone out to fight everyone else. Of course, Hitler didn't think of that way. And Hitler responded to this with, today, who remembers the Armenians? Meaning, no one's going to care. We'll do whatever we want. And this kind of logic, every country in total war does stuff like this. Not like full scale genocide, not even close. I'm not saying that, but every country does it. The U.S. did it. Who did the U.S. send to concentration camps because of who they are? In World War II. And heck, you get that attitude today. President Trump is going to sign an executive order either this afternoon or tomorrow. And everybody knows it's the ban Muslim refugees. And they make the argument whether or not that's good or bad, whatever, but it's not for what these people have done. It's for who they are. It's that kind of thinking that is pretty corrosive and happens all the time. <laughs>